Hi, everybody. This is Melinda Emerson, the Small Biz Lady, America's number one small business expert. And I'm excited to welcome you to another edition of the Small Biz Chat Podcast. Today's show is really going to be amazing. We're first going to talk about, you know, if things are going so well in your business, it might be time to get things in alignment. We're going to talk with an expert that's going to help us do that. And have you always been wondering, do you really have to pay that big money to a publicist? Well, guess what? My guest here today says, no, you don't. She's going to give you tips on how to pitch yourself to the media. And how many of you know that your mindset has everything to do with your business success? Well, I have an expert here today who's going to talk to us about how to have the right mindset for long-term success of your business. And what this is really about is that if you're looking to grow your sales in your business, sometimes you don't need to look look external. Sometimes you need to align things internally to make sure that all of your follow through systems are in alignment so that you can get the sales success that you want. And, you know, sometimes you might be thinking that I don't know anybody to raise my visibility with the media. Well, my guest here today says that is not true. You can absolutely know nobody and end up on the Today Show. So we're going to talk about how you can learn the right way to pitch yourself to local and national media. And if you are thinking about, you know, how to be more strategic in your business, it probably has a lot to do with how you're thinking about your business and yourself. So we're going to talk about that money mindset, the right mindset for your business in order for your business to be successful. Now here on the Small Biz Chat, we talk about how to start and how to grow. And we always bring in experts with diverse perspectives to give you advice you probably would have to pay for otherwise. Basically, we come at it from multiple angles and give you sage advice. Now, the Small Biz Chat podcast is a peer-to-peer mentoring show. We're all about giving you invaluable business advice so that you can take your business to the next level. The mission of the Small Biz Chat podcast is to end small business failure. And we can be seen on my Small Biz Lady YouTube page, as well as my Small Biz Lady Facebook page. So please make sure you go there and subscribe and share and leave us a comment because we love to give you more content that is working for you. So now it is time for me to introduce my three guests, and I'm so excited to do so. First up, we're going to talk with business consultant, Dave Newell. We're going to talk with pitch coach. Gloria Chow, and she's CEO of Gloria Chow PR, and we're going to talk to Dan Stolp. He is CEO of Sandler Training of Kansas City, and I am excited to learn from all of them. Now, let me introduce my guest, Dave Newell. He is on a mission to align the misaligned. He believes that connecting with leaders, he, be- he loves to connect leaders with systems that foster outstanding work and personal fulfillment. He collaborates with small business leaders to implement what he calls the five facets of business, a small business operating system to optimize businesses and foster team alignment around culture, strategy, operations, story, and finances. This framework provides leaders with the necessary clarity and alignment to crush both short and long-term goals. As CEO of Evolve Leadership Consulting, Dave has coached hundreds of leaders, both nationally and internationally, to implement his framework. For more information, go to evolve-consulting.com. Dave, welcome to the Small Fish Chat Podcast. Well, hey, thanks so much for having me. Now, tell me your origin story, right? How did you become the alignment guy, right? <laughs> tell me about that. Yeah, uh, the the term alignment really actually came from, you know, when I first started working, I actually started in community organizing. And I was working with nonprofits and farmers and government agencies to help uh, do some environmental work. And you can imagine that all three of those entities had some different ideas about how to approach that work. And what I realized is that everybody had a different desire. Everybody had a different want, but they all were looking for how do we work together better, right? And so my job was to find the common ground and build from common ground. And as I started getting more involved into small business and the business world, 
what I started to recognize is that businesses were often taking an approach of fixing one thing at a time. Like, all right, our leads are down. Let's get after leads or, you know, our operations, we need to document some processes or finances. We need to shore up our finances, whatever it might be. And they were taking these one-off approaches. And what we started to realize is that if you turn one of those dials, it influences everything else, right? If you change your target market, it might change your core business. If you change your core business, it might change who your target market is, so on and so forth. So what we realized is that, you know, instead of taking this kind of symptoms approach, the best way to address business challenges is to take a systems approach. Let's look at your business as a entire operating unit, as opposed to each individual function operating on its own. And as we've been able to do that, we've been able to kind of pull alignment to the forefront to say, well, if let's let's make sure that all five of those major systems are moving in the same direction. When we see that, we see businesses scale. We see a lot of the you know issues and challenges that they deal with kind of go to the wayside, so to speak. So how does a business know whether it's in or out of alignment? That's a really great question. There are lots of different variations to this, uh, but some of those things are the symptoms that you would normally see. What we say is you often will see the outputs, right? Which is, hey, we're missing our sales targets. Our you know, product isn't getting shipped out the door. Nobody's signing up for our workshop. Uh, you have disgruntled employees. You have people asking for raises or you know, equity. <laughs> you have internal communication breakdowns. Hey, this thing isn't getting done. And those are often symptoms of system problems, right? It's the output that you can see. So if it's tangible, if it's a tactical thing, and you find yourself kind of dealing with these types of issues over and over again, that typically means that, hey, there's something upstream that isn't working very well. There's something upstream that if we fixed it, you wouldn't see these outcomes or you wouldn't see these outputs on the back end. So it looks differently in very many differences uh, in, in all the different businesses, but often it's it's the outcomes that you can see. It's the outputs that you can see. Does it come down to the leadership though? Because right, we all know that's you know, stink starts at the head, right? So so is it is it really <laughs> is it is it really about the leaders of the organization and how they're communicating and what they're prioritizing? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we have a leadership framework that we tie to this. Uh, that has kind of five key disciplines to it or five key behaviors to it. Because what we know is, yeah, we can implement the world's greatest operating system into your business and it still doesn't work because people are the ones directing that system. And what we often say is that the system is perfectly designed to produce the results that it's producing, mm -hmm. right? Which is kind of a, well, obvious statement, but really what that means is, you know, what it requires of the leader is to recognize like, well, if we're getting this result, if the result is we're missing deadlines, if the result is we have internal communication breakdowns, if the result is our sales are down or our, you know, our revenue is stagnant, it's like, well, the system is designed to do that. So what we have to do as leaders then is step back and work on the business to say, okay, well, how are we organized? How am I sharing information? How am I, you know, what are we prioritizing or not prioritizing as leaders to then shift that system to produce a different result? So very much to your point, it is absolutely a leadership imperative to take that approach. And there's some behaviors and skills that come along with that. But what about... All right. So I, okay. So you've worked with me, you, you've trained me in your leadership training, but now I'm trying to implement, um, achieving alignment in my business, right? What are some of the common challenges that a small business leader might have when they're trying to, you know, write the ship, if you will? Yeah. Uh, two things. Uh, one is often there is a, there is a focus on the urgent, right? So we, there's a term out there called the tyranny of the urgent, which means we spend our time being reactive instead of proactive. And so everything that shows up, all the different issues that you're going to deal with, right? Like, you know, whatever it is, an employee's frustrated or they're asking for more money or they didn't follow through on the thing that they're following through tends to divert our attention from the long-term activity that we're trying to accomplish, right? So it is managing that short-term versus long-term which is one of those pieces is sticking with the priority, knowing this is the system that we want to build uh, and holding to it. Uh, so the tyranny of the urgent is one of those things. Uh, and number two is knowing where you are on the map, 
And so one of the things that we like to say is, you know, business leaders, I think, are really good, generally speaking, at saying, hey, this is where we're going, right? Like, this is the end, this is the journey, this is the destination. But they're not very good at saying, well, where are we starting on the map? So if you ever go, you know, hiking in the woods and you're looking at a hiking trail map, what's the first thing you look for when you look at that map? It's the you are here sticker, right? And if you don't know where you are, you don't know how to get where you're going. And right. so one of the other symptoms that I think I see from a leadership perspective is a distance from the reality of where their business actually is. And so they are aiming for this vision. They're aiming for this place that they want to go, but their starting point doesn't make sense because they're not aware of or not in touch with the current reality or the current state of their business. And so they start building things, but they're building things from a rocky foundation, not a, not a firm foundation. Okay, so break down for us what you call the five facets of business. Yeah, so the five facets are uh, culture, strategy, operations, story, which is the sales and marketing category, and finances. And what we find is that you know when we do our assessments, when we when we come in and start working with an organization, we find that most businesses are good at two or three of those things, right? Especially small businesses. We typically work with businesses that are five to fifty employees. And typically they're good at two or three of those things. So they might have a great culture, they might have a great story, you know, sales and marketing machine, but they can't get the product out the door and their finances are a little bit of a mess or they're, you know, constantly dealing with people issues, whatever it might be. And so our job is to elevate the aspects of the business that are failing or aren't as systematized or aren't as structured. And what happens is then you elevate everything in the business when you fix whichever facets are failing. And so we take that comprehensive look those are all the major buckets, right? Those are all the major operating systems in your business. So when you put all five of those things together, you know, it's rocket fuel at that point. Love it, love it. Well, listen, you're watching the Small Biz Chat Podcast. We're gonna come back and talk more about alignment. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady, and I wanna welcome you to Small Biz Lady University. Our mission here is to end small business failure. So all of the courses here are about two things, how to become your own boss or how to make money online. So that's what we do here. So whether you wanna learn about email marketing and sales funnels, or you're ready to get started with social media selling, or if you're really just getting started with e-commerce, you might wanna jump into our how to sell and market online course. Either way, if you want to learn how to become your own boss and do it well, I have everything you need here at smallbizladyuniversity.com. If you have any questions or have any technical problems getting signed up, just email us at support at melindaemerson.com. Take care. Welcome back to the Small Biz Chat Podcast. I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady, your host, and I'm here with my guest, Dave Newell. Dave, you were talking about the five facets of business. Now, can you talk about, um, you know, the the stages of alignment, right? You said that one of the biggest challenges is people don't know where they are in the first. Everybody's good at saying the goal, but they don't know, what, you know, how far are we from the goal to begin with? So can you talk about how you know, what are the three stages of alignment and like like a key principle behind each one? Yeah, so uh, the three stages are alignment, misalignment, and realignment. And so alignment is, all right, our systems are short up, streamlined, simplify, our people are committed to those systems, everything's kind of moving in the same direction. The challenge with alignment is it's not a static state. Right. Like once you achieve alignment, it doesn't mean you're going to stay there. Context, situations, economy shifts, et cetera. Right. The environment around your business might change. And so it's a constant state of trying to stay in alignment. Misalignment, which we've already talked about a little bit, is when you start to see those symptoms when your systems aren't working as well or your people aren't committed to operating those systems and you start to see the pain points. Right. You start to see revenue stagnation, internal communication breakdowns you know, missed deadlines, those types of things. And realignment is the act of discerning where are we, right? Where are we misaligned? Making a plan and then executing the plan to get back to alignment. And I think what I often see in the businesses that we work with is when they're in misalignment, it's not that they're unaware that they're misaligned. 
But what they haven't done is taken the intention to say, where are we misaligned? What's the plan? Uh, and, and how are we going to go ahead and execute this, right? So the realignment is an active state of moving back towards alignment, but it is taking a systems approach, not a symptoms approach. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that you sometimes say that you can leverage tension to drive positive change in a business. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so tension shows up all over the place in an organization. Uh, tension is essentially where the hard things are, right? So, uh, you know, uh, human beings have a natural tendency to resist difficult things. We like it when it's easy. We like it when it's comfortable, right? But we often say, you know, what's in the way is the way, right? So where are the hard places? And so with the leaders that we work with, we try to build up a capacity to do what we call kind of run to trouble, meaning, hey, this is a hard place. What we want to do is actually kind of turn ourselves towards the hard place and go dig into it and dig into it fully, right? So tension is the space that might be difficult conversations, conversations you're not having, a lack of trust in a particular environment. It might be, hey, this process isn't working, you know, for us or, you know, our sales pitch isn't working, et cetera. We often underdo those fixes. We kind of look for the quick fix or the fast fix to those solutions or here you deal with it, right? Like here, let's give that to somebody else and you take on that problem. And really what I'm looking for from leaders and organizations is to find the tense places, to find the places where things aren't working and to really lean in and dig in and fix those things. Because when you fix it, then everything else starts to get better. Love it, love it. All right, and tell us, what are some practical strategies or tools that small business owners can use to you know, improve alignment within their organizations? Yeah, there's really, there's really kind of a generalized thing and then a very practical thing. Uh, the generalized thing is uh, what I often find in organizations and what we built into the five facets system is there's design elements and there's execution elements. And generally speaking, your organization is more comfortable with one of those things than the other thing. Right. So ideation versus execution might be another way to break that tension down a little bit. Right. But those design elements are target market, core business, vision, values, purpose, uh, and kind of forecasting in your finances and making sure that those things are lined up. Because essentially, like and key strategy, and essentially what that is, is that's the design of our business. That's why we do what we do. It's who we're going to be while we do it. Right. And if those things are lined up, okay, now we have the frame. We have the design, we have the structure for our business designed. Now we have to translate that into an execution element, right? So I'll give you a really clean example. A lot of organizations do values, right? Like I think most small businesses are like, yes, we should have values. We've done values. That often turns into a perfunctory exercise, meaning we did this exercise. We had a retreat. We designed values together. Everybody felt great. It was all puppies and kittens and cotton candy. And then we got back to the office on Monday and that guy was being a jerk. And then this thing didn't work. And we hold nobody accountable to the values that we came up with. Right. So values as a design element is a good thing. You need to have that. You also need to have it as an execution thing. So we often add behaviors that are controllable underneath those values. So what are the concrete controllable things that make those values true? We had ritual, which is how are we ritualizing culture? What are some of those touch points that we can add? And then we add in accountability through performance reviews. So it's a good example of being able to bridge the gap between, all right, we have a kind of clear structure that we can do from a design perspective and then a clear structure that we can do from an execution piece. The really tangible thing that you can do is uh, there are all sorts of kind of small business assessments that you can take. We have one on our website. Uh, that's free. People can take it as 26 questions, takes five minutes. And it's a great indicator of where are we on the map, right? You are here. You can do that monthly. You could do that weekly. You could do it as many times as you want. And really what it'll do is it'll just show you like, where are we excelling and where aren't we? Right. Mm -hmm. So I think a real practical thing is to actually just pause for a minute and take stock and look for, all right, what are some of those symptoms that we're dealing with? And how is that teaching us about the systems that are broken behind it, right? So it is that just stopping, taking stock, actually assessing your business. Well, Dave, you have just dropped so much knowledge on me in just this short amount of time. I just have one last question for you. What is the best business advice you've ever gotten? Uh, there's so many. I've been so blessed to have so many wonderful people around me. I've learned a lot from a lot of different entrepreneurs. And I think uh, one of the best stories I've had is 
uh, about perspective. And so the the simple statement is have perspective. And if you find yourself agreeing with the majority, it's time to pause and reflect, which is don't just do what everybody else is doing. Don't just do it because it's trendy or because it's it's what the thing is, you know, that that you're hearing about all the time. You know, read this book, do this thing, follow this process, but do the thing that's really supposed to happen. Right. Like and have an and have a, your own opinion about it, have your own perspective on it and lean into that part. Uh, and I think that's been really helpful for me not to chase fads or not to just do the thing that everybody else is doing, but really having a perspective about something that maybe nobody's really talking about or thinking about. That's helped over time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. I really appreciated learning so much about this. And that's a great antidote for us to leave it on. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about how to pitch yourself to the media. You're watching the Small Biz Chat podcast, and we will be right back. Are you ready to become a boss? Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady. Click the button below and take my free boss quiz. This assessment will help you learn your entrepreneur type and find the right business model for you. Get this information about the number one asset in your business. Yeah, that's you. Welcome back to the Small Biz Chat Podcast. I'm Melinda Emerson, your guest. And if you're watching us, hopefully you're watching us on my Small Biz Lady YouTube channel or my Small Biz Lady Facebook page. Please subscribe and share this information. We want more small business owners to grow their business businesses with all this helpful advice. Also, please feel free to leave a comment. If you hear a great comment from one of my guests, give them a Howdy doody, right? Or just leave us a comment on a topic that you would love to see us address. Thank you so much. And we really appreciate all of your support of the Small Biz Chat podcast. Now, let me introduce my next guest. We are talking about how to get yourself to be more visible. And we are here with my guest. Her name is Gloria Chow, and she is an award winning small business PR coach and uh, the host of the top-rated small business PR podcast. Her untraditional yet proven PR methods have allowed anyone to get to top-tier earned media without needing to hire an agency or publicist or have industry connections or any PR experience. Some of her clients have been featured in Forbes, Business Insider, Crunchbase, and she's been featured on over 50-plus podcasts. Gloria helps early-stage founders hack their own PR and go from unknown to being seen, heard, and valued with her proprietary three CPR pitching method. One has one that has helped over 10,000 small businesses get over combined 1 billion organic free views in top tier outlets such as the New York Times, Vogue, Fast Company, Forbes, and more. For more information, go to Gloria Chow PR dot com gloria welcome to the small biz tech podcast oh my god thank you so much for that intro i'm so happy to be here oh my gosh listen <laughs> I, I think lots of people want to hear from you okay so let's just jump in how can you go from zero connections to landing a big media opportunity yeah, this is the thing that the agencies don't want to tell you so listen up PR is really simple don't let anyone tell you that it's not okay PR is literally writing a pitch and sending it out it's writing a cold pitch and sending it out. And if you know how to position your pitch, which is not your sales pitch, which is not your marketing pitch, a pitch for a journalist, and you know who to send it to, then you can just keep repeating that as a system. So it's really about translating our sales pitch, which we're so good at as founders, and really turning it into something that is newsworthy. So what does that mean? Leading with an insight, a trend, something that's not all about you, something that a journalist can use a value. It could be three steps or three tips or some insights that you're seeing. And we can dive into that later. Well, I think that's really important. I don't know if how many of you know this, but I actually used to be a television producer in my first career before I became an entrepreneur. So, I mean, you're like strumming my pain, like all these people pitching, oh, I wrote this book. Okay, so what, right? You know what I mean? Like, it, it's amazing how even people pitch my podcast that way. And it's extraordinary how often people are like, I'm just me, don't you want to talk to me? Um, No, actually, <laughs> you know, it's amazing. So can you talk about, um, some of the myths out there that small businesses might be having about getting PR and marketing for their business? 
100%. And this is, the, I actually love that you asked this first because it's really not about the actionable steps. It's about what we believe for ourselves. And I think we so often believe we have to be a fancy startup, but we need to know somebody to know somebody. And that's why we never actually do our own PR. And we think, okay, well, those are not, those are reserved for those big companies, right? Who have the fancy friends. And it's simply not true. So it's it's really about you honing in on that and realizing that you do not need time, money, or connections. Those, those are the three things that you don't need to get PR. And as long as you believe that, we can really get down to the basics of how to write and structure that pitch and start pressing send. Because everything you want is on the other side of the send button. That's kind of one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Everything you want is on the other side of the send button. So don't be crazy with that. All right. So now let's talk about how do I find the best angle to pitch the media, right? You got to have an angle or it's just not going to work. Yeah. Um, one more thing before we get into it is the thing is we're doing journalists a favor and journalists actually need fresh perspectives. If they were just the mouthpiece of fortune 500 big companies probably wouldn't be very credible or ethical. So think about it that way. You're actually helping them. So how do we actually help them? Right. We actually want to turn our pitch, which is very kind of, you know, marketing brochure, whatever. We want to turn that into something that's short, that's concise, that the journalists can work with. And so I have a three-step CPR method that I came up with, I kid you not, from literally cold calling hundreds of newsrooms and throwing spaghetti on the wall because I never worked a day in my life at any kind of agency. I used to work in the government. So I had zero connections. I was not a cool kid. I was like the person at the outside of the club, like, you know, the person with the clipboard not letting me in the club. So I was like, how do I crack this code? How do I actually get onto you know, a publication? And from all the pitches that I submitted, I realized that the best pitches that got responses have three things in common. They had C, which is credibility, which is one sentence on why you're pitching. Um, you are credible because you are a small business owner. You don't need fancy letters after your name. So C in CPR stands for credibility. P in CPR stands for point of view, because it's all about positioning yourself as an expert and experts have point of view. So usually in the pitch, it looks like three bullet points. It could be three tips. It could be three insights, three do's and don'ts. It could be a listicle, whatever, what have you. And R in CPR method stands for relevance, because what is what is news if it's not relevant? So think about the seasonality. Is it winter? Are you pitching something for skincare? Is it winter eczema? If you're a career coach, it could be about graduation season and people looking for jobs. If no matter what industry you're in, there's either a regulatory or a policy angle that you can tie it to. Maybe it's commenting about what the Fortune 500 companies are doing and how you're doing it differently. I could go on and on and on, but it's really about finding that piece of relevance that's really going to get the journalist's attention at the get-go. All right. So how do I find journalists? Right. Are they in the phone book? You know, where am I finding? Do we do we even still have phone books? Anyway, uh, but, but my point is, is that where do we find journalists? Like, how do I find this person I want to pitch to? I love that you asked that. So we just covered what to pitch. Now it's who to pitch. And it's definitely not the editor in chief of, you know, Vogue because they're doing their own book tour, honey. They're busy. So what you want to do is you want to pitch to the specific writer of that beat, whether it's sports, fashion, technology, entrepreneurship. You don't want to put, you know, like an info at New York Times or media at. You want to know who that journalist is. How do we do that? Well, we can do it by first installing a Google News Alert. So Google News Alert, it's a free tool you can install. And every day it pings you with all of the articles being published on your industry. And that's good for two reasons. One, you get to train your brain to think in terms of headlines, subject lines, and you start to be able to hone in that skill of knowing what stories people are writing about. The second reason why you want to do that is because guess what? Once you get the article, you can copy and paste their name into an Excel spreadsheet and you can start to populate your own media list. Now there's obviously, you know, uh, media portals and then we have this in our program as well, but you can start to do a grassroots like this. Another couple of tools, there's a tool called HARO, which stands for help a reporter out. You can sign up as a source and every day it will ping you with all the inquiries from all different types of journalists wanting to interview diverse people. You can also be on Twitter and all the ha uh, follow a hashtag called journal request. And that way you can see what journalists are looking for, who to interview, and whether or not you fit that that uh, demographic or not. I love it. I love it. You're giving some serious free game out here. All right. So let's talk about the actual pitch itself. What are the do's and don'ts of sending a pitch to the media? Okay. So we can talk all about this, right? Uh, but just really high level. If you want your pitch open, it's really about subject line. We have to optimize for the subject line so that it can get opened. A lot of times we are not, actually none of us are really taught this 
how to pitch to the media. So I understand that it's uncomfortable and you're like, what do I write? Do I put my name in? No, you want your subject line to quickly tell the journalist what the story is about. So I don't want name company, please feature me. I don't want anything scammy that looks like a marketing email, like an offer for you. It's it's really just it should read like a subject line, you know, like uh, three best skills for 2024 graduates looking for jobs. You see how that's very specific. You want that to be in the subject line. Now that we have a subject line, you want to optimize for the body of the email. You want it to be concise. In my CPR method, the P, which stands for point of view, I usually like to have three bullet points. So three insights, three tips. I like threes because you don't want it to go all the way really long and you don't want just one or two. You wanna just give the journalist just enough to show them that you have more to say, but you're not gonna put it all in the in the pitch. I also don't like it when it starts to sound like an unpublic, unpublished autobiography about how you went hiking in Nepal and you had this business idea and then you met you know, your business partner. No, it's really about the issue. And so the more it sounds like you and your company and, and it sounds like you know what it would be on your sales page, it's going down the wrong path because guess what? You're not selling to the journalist. The journalist is never going to buy from you. So we really have to tweak that pitch, take off our marketing hat and really put on the hat of an expert. What is the insight? What are the predictions? What am I seeing in my customers? And no, it doesn't have to be groundbreaking stories. I think a lot of people get tripped up because they say, well, everything's already been said. Or, you know, who am I to pitch this? This is obvious to you. Well, it's not about being obvious or groundbreaking. It's just about being in the, dis in the discussion. And I'll give you an example. We had someone who was a Pilates teacher and she, I kid you not, used our method and she got featured in a story in 2023 called What is Pilates? So this just goes to show that there is readership from every level. The news cycle is constantly churning out content. So don't let the fact that you don't have anything groundbreaking to say stop you from pressing that send button. I love it. I love it. Now I have a follow-up question to this. Do you send an attachment or not? Such a good question. I get that asked all the time. I personally don't like attachments because A, the spam filters are very um, are very advanced these days and you want to do whatever you can to increase that deliverability. So we talked about subject lines. So you don't want to add more friction. What you can do, because we all have more we want to say that we can't stuff in a pitch, use a hyperlink. And if you do something that's visual, like fashion, apparel, beauty, art, you can put in one photo. You can put in one photo that's beautiful, that's high quality, but not super huge in size. And you can embed it into, you know, the, the actual pitch. And you can simply say, for more information, you know, about us or, or, or this X, Y, and Z, just hyperlink it. Hyperlink it to your about section, hyperlink it to a, you know, folder, but hyperlink it so that the journalist, if they want, can click on it and go somewhere. But I would not, I would not recommend attachments, no. All right. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about the do's and don'ts of press releases. You're watching the Small Biz Chat Podcast, and we will be right back. Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady, and I want to welcome you to Small Biz Lady University. Our mission here is to end small business failure. So all of the courses here are about two things, how to become your own boss or how to make money online. So that's what we do here. So whether you wanna learn about email marketing and sales funnels, or you're ready to get started with social media selling, or if you're really just getting started with e-commerce, you might wanna jump into our How to Sell and Market Online course. Either way, if you want to learn how to become your own boss and do it well, I have everything you need here at smallbizladyuniversity.com. If you have any questions or have any technical problems getting signed up, just email us at support at melindaemerson.com. Take care. Hi there, welcome back to the Small Biz Chat Podcast. I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady, your host. And we are talking with Gloria Chow about DIY PR, to raise your visibility for your small business. All right, Gloria, I'm back to you now. Tell me about press releases. Is it passe or is it just about these two paragraph pitches and keeping it moving? Do I need a press release? And if so, how do I write one? So press releases, just to give you a one-on-one, -on -one, there's different buckets of media. So there's paid media, which is our ads, and then there's owned media, which is 
what we write and put out into a newswire. So that's where press releases fall into. It could be press releases. It could be blogs, something that we own. And then there's earned media, which is, you know, getting someone at like New York Times or Vogue to, to, to mention us. And I talked about how you can do that. So press releases do have a place in time, but you want to use them strategically. Usually what I like to do for press releases is to ask myself this question. Am I launching something? And is it time specific? And so if you can answer yes to both those things, like if you have a launch, if you have a research survey that you want to get out, if you have a partnership, if something that is time specific, then yeah, use a press release because a press release is a business announcement that is for that moment in time. And it goes and lives on the internet for decades. It's going to bring you SEO. It's going to give you backlinks. And it's a powerful way for people to search you and find you very quickly online. It doesn't replace all the other buckets of pitching, but it definitely is a way if you are, you know, launching something to get it out there. Another reason why you might want a press release is if you are truly the first to do something. So I work with, with a lot of founders doing really innovative things, and they might make a skincare oil with adaptogenic mushrooms, and they might be the first one. And so, yes, they would probably want to put that they are the first to formulate this elixir or whatever that is. So that is also another reason why you might want to use a press release. And here's some do's and don'ts about press releases. You don't want that press release, again, to stuff five to 10 different pieces of story. You would want the press release to be very focused on what it is that you are launching, and it's not gonna be the autobiography of your whole entire business. And I don't want it to be longer than one page. I want it to be super concise about what it is that you are announcing, and then that's the really the first kickoff process. So I think a lot of people think a press release is kind of like a story or it has to be many different chapters. It needs to be concise, kind of like a resume. You've heard that before, the longer a resume is, the less compelling it is, right? Because you're like, why do I need to be convince someone to hire me if I have you know, so much? So you want to be able to say it in a very concise way. I usually have a very powerful headline and a subheadline. The headline is the what, the subheadline is the how, and then I usually go into three or four paragraphs max. So it should fit in one page. A one page press release is really the golden standard. I love it. Excellent advice. All right, now let's switch gears a little bit. I want to talk to you about product-based businesses. And, you know, is pitching yourself for gift guides really an effective way to do DIY PR? Ooh, I love this so much because product makers are my people. And I think for so long we're told, well, just either just pay for ads, just keep feeding the algorithm machine. And no one really teaches anyone how to get into a gift guide because you either think it's scammy and pay to play or not. But here's the thing. We have hundreds of founders. Who, we have one that actually just got on Elle magazine yesterday and she pours these skin oil, like skincare cleansing oils in her home. And she was there mentioned with Dermalogica, a multi-million dollar company. So it's absolutely uh, available to you. All you have to do is think that it's available to you and use the CPR method again. So with products, think about the seasonality and what you're pitching for. So is it something for Valentine's Day? Is it something, it's a gift for mothers? Is it something that is better for end of year? Don't put your entire like product suite into one pitch. Select the best selling thing for that angle. So what I mean is you're not going to send them an order form. You're not going to send the journalist five products. You're not, it's going to be, this is why this product is perfect for Father's Day. Or this is why this product is perfect for the conscious consumer who's trying to reduce uh, you know, their waste to zero because we don't have packaging and everything's eco-friendly. So very, be very, very specific about that. And it's about pitching, connecting. And here's another hack. If you are pitching for a gift guide, please be specific with how, the dollar amount. A lot of times we have gift guides and, and raise your hand if you've seen this. It's like a gift, best gifts for under $100 or best gifts for stocking stuffers. Let the journalist know how much it is. If it's a premium price point, if it's a stocking stuffer price point, uh, a link to buy it. Like where is it on Amazon? Is it on Target? Where do we buy it? And where do you ship to? So that way the journalist knows if it's going to be in time or not for that holiday. Right. And then the thing about gift guides, they're about six in nine months in advance, right? They're not like, it's not a quick thing. It's like, you got to pitch early, right? Well, for print, for print, yes. But for a lot of the founders, if you want digital searchable, I mean, people write last minute gift guides, even like, you know, 24 hours before, you know, if you have a, something that's digital, it could be a gift card. And here's another thing that a journalist told me. She says, we even write gift guides for after Christmas. How do you spend your gift cards? So there's always a reason, there's always a season. You just have to really take advantage of that and know that there is a blue ocean of opportunities for you. You got to get creative. I'll give you another example is we had a, a boudoir photographer and we were able to use the CPR pitch to pitch her boudoir photography as the best self-care gift this Valentine's Day. And she got on well and good. 
So just be creative with it. You know, there's, there's always definitely an angle. You just have to find that angle. All right. What is the best business advice you've ever received? I said it before. I'll say it again is everything you want is on the other side of the send button. Why have it not be you? Why not put your name in the hat? Don't wait. You deserve to be seen, heard, and valued. Thank you so much, Gloria. You are a wealth of information and we're going to be right back and we're going to talk about money mindset. You're watching the Small Biz Chat podcast and we'll be right back. Are you ready to become a boss? Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady. Click the button below and take my free boss quiz. This assessment will help you learn your entrepreneur type and find the right business model for you. Get this information about the number one asset in your business. Yeah, that's you. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Small Biz Chat Podcast. I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady, your host, and I'm America's number one small business expert. You know, oftentimes in business, we think we have a revenue problem when in fact, you might have a mindset problem. And my guest here today is going to talk to us about what is a winning mindset and how you can always reboot yours if you find yourself in a rut. Let me introduce my guest. His name is Dan Stolp, and he is known as the Energized Entrepreneur. He's a business mentor and a popular local and national speaker. He's the award-winning owner of Sandler Training of Kansas City, a renowned business development coaching and sales training business. Dan specializes in working with presidents and owners who sell and peak performer sales professionals who want to push through to their next level. For more information, you can go to www.stout dot sandler.com dan welcome to the small biz chat podcast thank you for having me all right so let's jump right into it dan how do you define a winning mindset for a small business owner sure uh winning mindset is really about what you think about you know there's the tale of the two wolves you know that are competing against each other and they always say which one's going to win and it's the one that you feed so uh, we, we are going to have things that happen day in and day out. You know, we're human beings, not human doings. So it's a, not a matter of what happens to us. It's more a matter of what we do with it. So I, I always say, you know, some people, they'll say, you know, it is what it is. And that's a completely different statement than someone who says it just is. And I can get into that a little bit later. Well, let's get into it. I mean, what are the main components required for developing a winning mindset? Sure. So we'll get into some competencies, you know, and if this was so darn easy, everybody would be doing it. But uh, but one of the, the six ones that I'll talk about is uh, ambition and drive, that internal drive, because if, if you don't want something to change, it will not change. And then but then the other part of that is, am I taking action on what I want to change? So one is about passion, internal passion. The other one is about commitment. And you can have people that uh, a lot of people see those as one and the same, but they're not because some people make things happen and others keep things happening and some can do both and some can do neither. So it's really about those two are a good, are a good start, but also accepting responsibility. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the drama triangle, but if you feel like you're a victim, it's not going to change because it, there's, there's, we don't, don't want to be a persecutor. We don't want to be a victim. We just want to take responsibility. And then, of course, positive outlook. But another one is just knowing where you are, you know, uh, knowing what your strengths are, knowing what you're not so good at. Because if I think I'm great at everything, I'm probably not, and I'm not going to change. On the other hand, if I think I'm bad at everything, I'm probably not, and I'm not going to change. Right. What you believe is true, no matter whether it's good or bad, right? Right. So how, can you share an example, you know, from your own experience where, adopting a winning mindset really made a huge difference in your business success? Yeah. So for me, it was really about, you know, I am a performance coach for sales and sales leaders. And so I need to be eating my own dog food, so to speak. And uh, so part of that is, you know, just working on myself and then be able to transfer and leverage that. And so one of the things that a lot of people think about winning mindset is that they, they just have to think differently. And that is, part of the puzzle, but what really needs to precede that is to act differently. So one of the, the, the sayings I like to say is act as if. So if I'm uh, you know, a $500,000 producer right now and I want to be a million dollar producer, 
you know, I can continue to tell myself I'm a million dollar producer, I'm a million dollar producer, you know, positive mental attitude, and it might happen. But what might be work better is I said, let's pretend I was a million dollar producer. What would I be doing now that I'm not doing? What would I not be in allowing that I'm allowing? And what happens is when you start to act as if that's the quickest, um, quickest way to change attitudes and attitudes take time to change. So if it's not just about thinking, it's about acting and thinking. Right. It's about thinking and doing right. And doing. You know? Right. Right. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly, but I, but I got to step back though and push back just a little bit on you because I'm, I'm like, okay, how can you balance a winning mindset with really taking the time to learn from your failures and mistakes? Right. Good one. Absolutely. Yes. So first of all, 80% of us are more likely to modify our behavior to avoid a, a pain. So instead of seeing failure as the enemy, failure is our friend. Now, this is the unintentional person is more likely to do that. Now, only 20% of us are willing to modify our behavior for gain. And I'm a big believer. Let's just modify our behavior no matter what. But the reality of it is failure can, can be if we're intentional and if we step back to your point and say, okay, that did not go the way I wanted it to. And this gets back to accepting responsibility, Melinda. You know, I'd say, hey, how did I contribute to that outcome? I'm not blaming. Uh, where would I have maybe done something a little bit differently next time? Not, you know, so we don't wanna focus on what we did, didn't, or did or didn't do that caused it. We wanna talk more about next time. So it might be, you know, that uh, prospect brought this up. I chose not to go there. Three weeks down the road, after we both spent a lot of time, here we are, and that's the reason I didn't get the deal. So we could say, you know, well, I should have said something. It's more about next time, if that comes up, I'm gonna address it right then and there. That would be okay. an example. Okay, so you're like, learn from, like take the time to learn from why it didn't work out exactly. and don't just assume why it didn't work out. And you want to focus on next time, not what didn't go well. It's kind of, I don't know if you've ever been lost before and you didn't have a map and you got there and you go, oh, thank goodness I got there. And then two weeks later, you're going there again. You don't have a map. You go, oh, that looks familiar. Oh, I think I'm getting close. I saw that. But what looks familiar is when you were lost. <laughs> so the reality of it is we, we do need to make sure that we're saying next time I'm going to have a map, next time, whatever, and follow that instead of, um, making the same mistakes over and over again. Well, but just because you're the business owner and you have a winning mindset, how do you make that part of the culture of your organization? Yeah. So first of all, you, uh, you, know, you can say things come from the top down, right? So, and birds of a feather flock together. We've got all these different sayings. So it does start at the top. And what happens is if, uh, if you're a, a, a you know, working on yourself, I think it's important for people at the top to continue to be working on themselves. A lot of times, sometimes they get a little comfortable. I've arrived. I got this. And that's usually a slippery slope down. So instead, we want to always be working on ourselves. And then we will attract different people to our organization. So when I'm at a higher frequency, you know, where I'm um, seeing the positives, I'm not getting down, I'm either going to A, attract more of those people at a higher frequency. Uh, some people will say, you know, I wish I was like that and they're gonna become more like that. And then the low frequency people will be repelled. And that's exactly what we want to have happen. We don't wanna be attracting low frequency people. So it's really important for those leaders to not just be developing their people, but as or more importantly, developing themselves. So let's talk about salespeople for a minute, because I know a lot of small business owners struggle to hire, manage, and coach salespeople. So how do you go about, I mean, let's say I hire this, you know, hotshot salesperson who came in here with this great track record from the last place they were, and they get to you and they're like, they're falling flat. They're yeah, not converting. Uh, and like, what do you... Yeah. What do you do? Because I've been in this position myself a dozen times. So I, so I want to understand 
What do you do when you hire, a, you know, you make this investment, you give them a serious base and not make them a commission-based salesperson? Like, what do you do when, I mean, do you just like, oh my God, they're not converting, get them out of here? Or should you actually try to train them? Yeah, those are, um, if I had a quarter for every entrepreneur, I wouldn't have to work. <laughs> but you're, you're right. It, it is a conundrum, but there are some things that we can do. Part of it is um, a lot of smaller companies, maybe they're just looking to hire one or two people. They don't have a transferable and repeatable sales process. So what happens is they're able to get to do it because they're the owner. They have an equal business posture. They just have uniqueness to them because they own the place. You know, they're paying all the bills. They just have a different posture. And they assume that if I hire someone who's actually a salesperson, they'll outperform me. And they can. But what happens is if there's no process, then what happens is you delegate your sales process to this person that can leave. And um, I've had clients that had, you know, entrepreneurs that have had seven salespeople in eight years and none of them have worked out. And, I, and I'm and blaming, but I say, what's the common denominator? You. Yes. Right. So, you, so something needs to change. So having Sandler happens to be a repeatable transferable process. It's not the only one. The other thing is, is people don't use outside assessments before they hire people. I mean, salespeople are the hardest people to interview because they're used to being in interviews. And so if we don't have any data, and actually those six competencies that I mentioned earlier are part of that, you actually get scores on it. And some things are easier to help people through than others. And, you know, if someone's not ambitious, you're both going to be working really hard to get the ambitious and it's never going to carry the day. Interesting. Well, I really appreciate that, even if it's just a answer to one question about it because <laughs> it's, it's a very stressful it's a very special stressful, stressful, stressful thing in a, in, in a lot of business owners and then how can the you know when you bring a new salesperson into an organization how can you help them through collaboration you know deliver a high performance yeah so one of the things that a lot of people um, owners aren't doing this either is they're tracking their sales outcomes but they're not tracking the five or six key performance indicators that lead to sales outcomes. And in Sandler speak, we call that the cook it, cookbook. It's your recipe for success. And what a lot of people, a lot of people just do is they get 10 appointments a week or call 20 people a day. And it's just based on nothing. I mean, nobody ever questions it because they just assume, you know, but the reality of it is if we start to track these KPIs, like attempting to reach someone, whether we actually talk to them, whether we actually meet with them, whether we actually quote them and then actually sell them something, we can reverse engineer what their new business goal is into daily behaviors. And so when I don't know what my daily behaviors need to be, that's a, that's a, a development opportunity. When I know what they are as a salesperson, I consistently don't do them. That's an attitude issue. And those are the folks that you want to help them back out into the workforce because they're just not going to do the work. Interesting, interesting. All right, last question for you, Dan. What is the best business advice that you've ever gotten? Best business advice. You know, uh, I, I feel like I'm breaking, you know, kind of saying this too many times, but there's a couple books out there that also support this is the little things done consistently well over a period of time lead to quantum leaps. And, you know, we're in, you know, when I was younger, it was the microwave, you know, it's so fast, you know, now it's instant messaging and text and all, everything, everything so quickly, but there are certain things you cannot just skip over. And so it's the little things that are oftentimes holding us back. Thank you so much for that, Dan. That is so insightful and helpful. And I'm, and I'm going to think about that. Now, what I'd like to do is bring back my other guests, and we're going to have a really quick panel that I like to call Hit It and Quit It. And here is how it works. So I want to invite Dave Newell and Gloria Chow back. And what we're going to do is I'm going to ask each of you the same question. You only have 30 seconds to respond, and you cannot, I repeat, you cannot repeat someone else's answer. So if so, you're going to get a really loud noise on you. Okay. All right. So Dave, since you've been on, on ice the longest, the first question is going to come to you. Then it's going to go to Gloria and then to Dan. So the first question is, what is your favorite podcast? 
Uh, my favorite podcast is the Akimbo podcast by Seth Godin. Good stuff. Good stuff. Gloria, what's your favorite podcast? I'm biased because I love my own podcast, Small Business PR. Shameless plug because I am a PR person. <laughs> okay. All right. And Dan, what's your favorite podcast? Uh, Darren Daly by Darren Hardy. Say it again. Darren Daly by Darren Hardy. Darren, Darren Hardy. Anything Daly. by Darren Hardy. Got it. Got it. Love it. Okay, great. Haven't heard of that one. I've got to check it out. Um, let's go to the next question. Gloria, you're going to get it first this time. Then you, Dan. Then you, Dave. What is your favorite business app? Favorite business app. I really love Notion. I do all my SOPs in there and it's just so easy to create pages, publish them and do all my onboarding checklists on there. Awesome. Dan, what about you? You know, I'm going to say LinkedIn because it's it's who you know. And I uh, personally don't like to cold call. And if I can find someone who knows someone, they'll introduce me. I'm all about that. So I'm in LinkedIn a lot. I, I Listen, I get 90% of my business out of LinkedIn too. So I believe it. Dave, what about you? What's your favorite app? I got to go with ClickUp. I think my team would be mad at me if I didn't say ClickUp. The kind of, you know, project management meets all system, right? We use it to communicate. We use it to track, you know, what we're doing, goals, et cetera. It's a pretty comprehensive, awesome system. Awesome sauce. Thank you. All right. Third question. This one's going to come to you first, Dan, then you, Dave, then you, Gloria. What is your favorite old school marketing tip? I would say AB marketing. That's AB cool. marketing. Yeah. It, so a lot of people always say, well, should we do this or should we do this? I said, well, let's do a hundred doing A and then do a hundred. It could be emails, it could be texts, it could be LinkedIn posts, and let's do a hundred B and then let's track our results. And that's just a term I heard a million years ago. A B marketing. Yeah. A B testing. Okay. That's I didn't understand it at first. That's why I was like, wait a minute, say it again. That's why I understand. It. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Gloria, what's your favorite old school marketing tip? Honestly, just over delivering and serving the audience you already have. A lot of times we think it's a leads problem, but we have so we have pots of gold just within our own customer community. Now you're speaking my language. I'm like, love on the people who have already loved on you. Yes. Please focus on existing customers. Please. Yes. All right. Dave, what do you yeah, actually, I uh, I think content marketing, answering the questions that your customers are actually asking, right? So like paying attention to, you know, what are you hearing from those customers that have already loved on you, as you put it, right? Uh, what are they actually asking you? And then writing the articles that answer those questions as opposed to theoretically kind of addressing what you think is interesting, answer what they think is interesting. I, I could not could not agree with you more. All right, last question. Dave, you're first, then you, Gloria, then you, Dan. What is the best business book you have ever read? Best business book you ever read. Ever read is a tough one for me. I think there's probably 20. I will start with the most recent. Uh, I read one called The Boutique uh, most recently, uh, which is really about small service businesses. And it's super practical, super helpful, uh, shows you kind of how to start one, how to scale one and how to sell one. And I thought it was just very, very clean, very simple, very practical. And I've already applied several lessons from it early on. I love it. I'm going to grab that one. Gloria, what about you? I'm going to go with something unconventional. Um, I love the book, The Soul of Money by Lynn Twist. And it's not really a business book, but as someone who has struggled with my own, you know, generational money stuff, especially as a woman of color and daughter of immigrants, um, that book just really illuminated to me the, the power and flow of energy and how it's about making it circulate and believing in co-creation and how together we will always achieve more than if we were to hoard or have an energy of constriction. So The Soul of Money by Lynn Twist. I like it. I like it. All right, Dan, what do you got? What's your favorite business book? I would say uh, Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. And it ties back to forming good habits. And I don't have to be as disciplined anymore. And, it'll, and it's those little things done consistently well over a period of time. I love it. I love it. And, you know, my favorite business book is actually 10X is Easier Than 2X by Dan Sullivan. I love this book. I've read it two or three times now. 
<laughs> Gloria likes this book too. Um, and I think that, you know, it's given me the thoughts and power to, you know, reinvigorate my entire business and I'm excited about it. All right. Thank you guys so much for being on the Small Biz Chat podcast. Thank you so much to Dave Newell, to Gloria Chow of Gloria Chow PR. And thank you to Dan Scalp, owner of Sandler Training of Kansas City. Thank you all for joining me for this episode of the Small Biz Chat Podcast. If you are an author, speaker, coach, or consultant looking to learn how to become a national brand, I want to help you attract corporate brands, media opportunities, and more at my Brandy Demand six-month group coaching program, which starts on March 20th. I'm teaching A to Z how to build a million dollar brand. And I've worked with over 150 corporations and I want to teach you how to do it too. So all you have to do is head over to smallbizladyuniversity.com for more details and sign up today because space is limited. The mission of the Small Biz Chat Podcast is to end small business failure. And I want to leave you with this. You never lose in business. Either you win or you learn. God bless everybody.